Thanks, Michelle. So let's hear now a little bit from a, a bilateral perspective, uh, Ambassador Eric uh, Gusby, head of PEPFAR. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to uh, be in an audience with so many old friends and colleagues, mentors. Um, it really is quite a assembled group. So uh, it's really an honor to uh, share this time with you today. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Minister of Health from Malawi, who's uh, been kind enough to make the journey, and all of you who've made long journeys. Um, it's, uh, it is an important discussion to continue to convene uh, and have us uh, kind of rejuvenate uh, our focus on what the facts show and, as Michelle has said, uh, where we need to go. I'm going to go through these slides actually fast, so I apologize for them, but they are available uh, uh, by the committee. Uh, I want to thank Julio for uh, convening this discussion once again. So, so how far have we come? If I could have the next slide. You know, we really do find ourselves at a remarkable moment, uh, the convergence of science that is in place, uh, our understanding of the pathophysiology, the natural history of disease, uh, of HIV infection in an individual, and also our understanding of how the virus moves through populations. We have matured, uh, we have been uh, observant, and we have documented uh, much of that. Uh, our ability to take science, to inform policy, to move out of pilot program responses into scale responses is uh, what I think many of the vertical programming like PEPFAR, uh, like the Global Fund with HIV, TB, and malaria have shown us that we indeed uh, can move uh, this science quickly uh, and bring it not just in a pilot response but to scale response. We have also gotten better at putting points of care and our ability to uh, take large motors of resources uh, like Gavi for immunizations, uh, like PEPFAR and the Global Fund. Uh, organizations like Unitaid have focused on uh, commodities, pricing, uh, dropping those, those prices, uh, and have put us in a position where we now know the science, we now have uh, the demonstrated ability to move things to scale programmatically and implementing them. Uh, we have resources that are focused on increasing uh, the ability to put that more sophisticated monitoring and evaluation uh, capability in distant sites, not just capitals, and has given our people, those who use and depend on these services, uh, the opportunity to benefit from the science that's known. The economic growth in middle income and lower income countries uh, that we're seeing, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, is another motor of resource that's converging at this moment uh, to fuel and push our ability to garnish those profits uh, to allow com countries to invest in their people. Uh, next slide. We have reached uh, the programmatic tipping point in nine countries over the last two years. Uh, the countries that are uh, below the one level, uh, the number of people who are becoming newly infected uh, versus uh, uh, ex being exceeded by the number of people who are being placed on antiretroviral therapy. Those nine countries at the, at the yellow and blue uh, uh, have, have, have achieved this. The next group that's coming in are right there, and then uh, those, the last four on the end, uh, are going to uh, present more challenges for us uh, to move things to scale. But we are quite confident that we will be able uh, to keep uh, the uh, drop in number of new infections in a negative slope. Next, uh, next slide. Next slide, please. So the blueprint uh, that we've put forward last November, uh, asked by Secretary Clinton, uh, Secretary of State, uh, in the United States to engage in a uh, narrative discussion that really took the science and spoke to some of the elements that needed to be addressed uh, for us to reach an AIDS-free generation. Next slide. So, saving lives, we have talked about, this meeting is about the uh, high impact that uh, antiretroviral therapy affords not only the individual but also uh, the uh, public uh, 
population, the larger population, uh, interrupting, interfering, preventing uh, the movement of the virus from an HIV positive person to a negative through uh, the uh, use of antiretroviral drugs, dropping viral loads, et cetera. Uh, the application of this in populations uh, to reduce uh, spread uh, in high risk populations uh, is something that uh, I think we have uh, seen for a long time in discordant couples. Those of us who've taken care of patients have uh, noticed that for many years, that individuals who were on effective antiretroviral therapy moving to undetectable uh, would have uh, unprotected sexual relations with their partners uh, and not transmit the virus. Anecdotally, uh, Mike Cohen's work really took that uh, into looking at the specifics of it in the 052 study and have really put us in a position where we cannot ignore a 96% drop in infectivity. PMTCT uh, are, you know, going back to really the 076 ACTG days uh, in the early 90s uh, with AZT and Lynn Moffison's work uh, really allowed us to uh, appreciate the fact that antiretrovirals uh, did have an application. We now see that when we use one drug, two drugs, three drugs, we have increasing ability to uh, prevent the uh, movement of the virus from the HIV positive mother to the baby. Voluntary medical male circumcision, a 64% plus drop in infectivity that has been uh, cumulative over time. It, doesn't, it keeps on giving uh, to invest a uh, effort in trying to get the uh, 15 to 50 year old circumcised and then start a newborn uh, uh, strategy at the same time uh, is the challenge. A huge uh, social education component to this uh, that requires a political buy-in, uh, but we have learned how to do this now and have been aggressively uh, trying to take this to scale. Next slide. These are some examples of countries at different stages in their response to the tipping point, the blue line showing the trajectory, the red line, uh, the, the trajectory without uh, focused and movement to high impact interventions uh, like uh, treatment, PMTCT, male circumcision, targeted condom distribution, et cetera. The red line moved that slope downward at 350. Then uh, in Zambia, which has moved into the 80 to 90% HIV positives on antiretroviral therapy uh, with um, uh, the trigger at 350 to uh, continue to drop that slope uh, more, we need to move it to 500. The next slide, that's the green, that's the green line. Kenya showing the same type of relationship uh, is, uh, is also there. Uh, the combinations of different prevention interventions are different in every country. Uh, understanding the demographics matched with uh, the response. In other words, uh, doing male circumcision uh, in countries where men are already, uh, male are already circumcised will not have the same impact as in countries where they're not. Uh, those types of alignments, which are just kind of common sense. The next slide. In Uganda, we actually had our uh, number of new infections uh, incidents moved in the wrong direction. Uh, as we moved away from high impact prevention interventions, we've been able to re-equilibrate uh, that and move it back down. But it's an ephemeral, uh, transient intervention that if we do not sustain, keep our foot uh, on the accelerator. We also saw this in Tanzania. Uh, the, uh, the virus will come back uh, in force. Next slide. The treatment of pregnant uh, women, virtual elimination, PEPFAR has been uh, with UNAIDS uh, and UNICEF, has uh, really committed itself to virtual elimination of pediatric HIV by 2015. Uh, we are well along the way to that. There are 390,000 children born annually uh, who are HIV positive on the planet. Uh, we, in order to um, identify 750 thousand HIV positive pregnant women in 22 countries in sub-Saharan Africa uh, had to test 45 million people uh, to find those uh, women. Uh, of those started the 750,000 on antiretroviral therapy and in 2012 alone, this was in 2012, we were able to prevent 230,000 uh, uh, potential HIV positive babies from being born. Uh, 
this is a goal that uh, Michelle has been a, a wonderful uh, champion in bringing the political will uh, to uh, countries challenging ministers of health uh, and mostly presidents on uh, the need to uh, coordinate and aggressively sustain uh, their focus, energy, and resources on this. Next slide. The uh, Malawi, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, happy that the minister is here. Uh, the uh, step off from the pediatric cascade from finding to uh, initiating staging, initiating antiretroviral therapy. Uh, you can see that each at each of these uh, moments in the movement of people uh, in real time, in real places, uh, loses many people, lost to follow up. Uh, movement toward uh, initiating HIV positive pregnant women on antiretroviral therapy, regardless of CD4 count, uh, has eliminated the leakage. If I could have the next slide. We can see here in an MMWR report uh, the extraordinary leap that occurred in number of individuals identified and retained uh, over that cascade continuum, the number of people started on antiretroviral drugs, and the benefits that were afforded. Next slide. This uh, Malawi's leadership has resulted in a different dialogue on the continent. Uh, the green countries have moved to accepting a B plus strategy now where regardless of CD4, pregnant positive women will be started on antiretroviral therapy. But it has virtually, uh, in every country, caused a reconsideration of whether or not uh, single dose nevirapine, AZT, 3TC in combination, or three drug combination should be initiated, especially in countries with high um, fertility rates. Uh, we believe that over the next uh, few years, uh, this will move. It is now out of the science discussion uh, into mostly a resource uh, discussion. Next slide. This is just to remind us how difficult uh, male circumcision is. Uh, we have had uh, uh, not the uh, rapid uh, implementation of this intervention. Uh, we have learned that it requires a concerted, focused dialogue with political leadership uh, at the highest levels in country uh, before you begin a social uh, marketing campaign uh, to increase awareness. Uh, we have found that couples uh, are better than single individuals uh, in terms of targeting the male. It's targeting both male and their partners uh, to, uh, to have this message conveyed. We're having trouble also starting the newborn uh, circumcision at the same time. Uh, so this, although uh, has, uh, we're early in the to scale most of the central elements to be successful on this. Next slide. So smart investments, uh, go where the virus is, use your money uh, wisely in that regard. Uh, TB, TB associated uh, uh, morbidity and mortality uh, with HIV is well known to this audience. Uh, many of you have dedicated much of your professional uh, lives, research focus on this connection. Uh, we are now shifting our attention to stopping tuberculosis, uh, being aggressive at it, and moving into a, uh, a much more comprehensive dialogue with political leadership uh, to make what is complacency in many countries uh, aware of the fact that you have a, a disease that is diagnosable and curable. And we are committed to uh, playing our role in that. Key populations is critical. Every uh, response to an epidemic in the developed as well as uh, in our resource poor settings, uh, the United States, Canada, Western Europe, uh, key populations are often uh, marginalized, uh, require special uh, strategies to identify, enter, and retain people in care over time. Uh, people who are participating in illegal acts often do not want to reveal themselves uh, to authority and medical institutions. Uh, without those special strategies, the virus continues to move through these populations. And then cost controls, getting good at doing it cheaper, uh, moving to generic procurement distribution systems, uh, having uh, unit cost advantages realized, uh, and sharing the burden of cost across uh, the population at highest and lowest risks. We're getting much better at understanding how to do that. Next. Uh, TB made the point, TB comorbidity 
Uh, we've had profound drops in tuberculosis, uh, but nowhere near what it should or can be. Uh, and we, again, remain committed to that. Next slide. So efficiencies in art scale up, lowering drug costs, using financial and economic data to plan strategy, building the partner nation's capacity to use the fiscal data so they can understand better how their dollar is being spent, where it's being spent, how it relates to high impact interventions or not, and to have the courage and knowledge to move those resources to high impact interventions. Uh, empowering leadership in country to understand these elements, uh, which starts with their understanding of how much money they as a country are putting into uh, and investing in their people. Uh, PEPFAR has put a huge amount of effort into uh, teasing out those unit costs by country uh, at both the site level and above. Uh, we've now moved to 20 countries. Uh, we'll have completed 33 by the end of next year. Next slide. So science, optimizing treatment, science to policy, uh, to program, uh, moving from bench uh, to bed. Uh, I think the uh, story around HIV and its response has been a breathtaking example of all of those uh, continuums being realized and, uh, and still in progress. And I think uh, uh, we all can be proud of that. Next slide. Point of care uh, uh, technology, the uh, gene expert identification of mycobacterium tuberculosis with the presence of resistance is going to allow us to diagnose and treat uh, the right disease with the right treatment uh, at the earliest possible time, uh, not weeks or months after uh, either a culture comes through or uh, more commonly a treatment failure is identified. Next slide. We also feel that uh, the health system strengthening that uh, these programs like PEPFAR have done in developing uh, a expectation for monitoring lab capability has moved our colleagues and country from what has been predominantly a syndromic management approach uh, to one of diagnosing and treating disease. Uh, the wide availability of high quality control systems, quality control, QA uh, uh, systems in these laboratories and an accreditation process that the Center for Disease Control um, now based uh, through the African Society for Laboratory Medicine uh, in the African Union uh, has made, uh, will make, I think, a contribution over the next few years uh, that really solidifies this game. Next slide. Uh, so the strategic engagement of the scientific community, uh, we have uh, tried to uh, infuse a uh, scientific basis for what we do in our programmatic decision making. We are trying now to push uh, that type of rigor and intellectual honesty into our partner uh, country uh, decision making implementation and planning processes. Next slide. The shared responsibility idea, Michelle has been eloquent in this for years. Uh, no one can do this alone, no one country. Uh, we understand that. Rich countries have an ethical responsibility to move resources to those who need them because they can. Uh, and that ability to hold ourselves accountable to that and to partner, uh, not in a donor host country relationship, but in a collegial partnership uh, with countries that are heavily burdened uh, with morbidity and mortality from the burden of the, of the disease, uh, with countries that have the ability uh, to uh, support. Uh, expand the capacity of the country, uh, use country resources, uh, many instances, global fund resources, PEPFAR resources, foundation resources, other uh, bilateral uh, donor uh, activity uh, is really convened by the partner country's leadership to make those allocation decisions. Next slide. This is just an example uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, the, the table on the bottom just shows uh, a a portfolio of a diversified resource uh, identified from a variety of different sources uh, to come together uh, in a unified response. Next slide. So I'm going to zip through this very quickly. Uh, emerging issues for us, uh, the issues of resistance, East Africa being uh, the most uh, uh, prominent in its, uh, in its evolution. 
Uh, overall, we're seeing really uh, low rates, 86% uh, or so, next slide, of our population is being retained in care over time. Uh, in looking at uh, some of our heavy, high-numbered uh, uh, countries, uh, we see the development of resistance really in pediatric populations. First, going to second line, they're our largest group going to second line. It's somewhere around 2.5% uh, of the total uh, people on treatment. Uh, we are in a position to survey, monitor, and uh, be aware of growing rates of resistance. There are some areas that show no, most areas show no uh, resistance developing. A very different picture than we saw uh, in the United States and Western Europe because of the evolution of how our drugs came out. Next slide. Uh, we are supporting scale-up of viral load to best monitor this and identify resistance as early as possible. Unitate is working with us on this as well as the UN agencies, UN, UN AIDS in particular. Next slide. Just to say that an AIDS-free generation is indeed in sight if we continue to increase our resources, continue to be smart at where our resources go, uh, understand uh, and respond to the changing needs of the population uh, as the epidemic uh, matures, uh, and to uh, hold ourselves accountable uh, for the political will being sustained uh, which is a very hard thing to hold. Next slide. Um, uh, I, I, I didn't want to sound so pessimistic with all of this that we forget the impact that PEPFAR has had. We have moved now to actually 5.3 million people on treatment. Uh, the number of people uh, that have gone into PMTCT programs, uh, the care and treatment, we are now taking care of over 5.5 million orphans and vulnerable children in this program. Uh, and I told you about the male circumcision. Next slide. We remain committed uh, with uh, all of the United States leadership uh, to continuing uh, this focus and will uh, continue on uh, through the Obama administration and I dare say uh, uh, beyond. Next slide. Thank you.